Isaiah chapter 52 on page 741. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy, for eye to eye, they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of of our God. That's Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 2. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have laboured side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, Practice these things, and the God of peace be with you all. On the 23rd of April this year, Bill and Jill were both here visiting central London. Now, Bill was trying to make the most of the short time he had in the city, and uh, he was on the tube, he picked up the magazine that was just lying there next to him, and he saw the words, keep hydrated. So he thought, ah, great idea, took a sip from his bottle, and on he went. Now, Jill was also on a journey through London, and she was facing many challenges, but she'd also seen that magazine. But for her, well, it had affected her dramatically, very differently. In fact, what she'd read was making a great difference in her journey. Because the 23rd of April was the day of the London Marathon. Bill was here as a tourist, that magazine he'd picked up, well, it was the London Marathon Training Guide. He would found it, well, it was interesting enough, he quite liked the pictures as he went through it, and he liked that little phrase, keep hydrated. Whereas, well, it hadn't actually made, obviously, that much of an impact on him. But then you had Jill, that runner, she was so desperate to finish this, her first marathon. And that training guide had been just what she'd needed, and she had followed it really carefully. You're wondering, what's all this got to do with Philippians 4? Well, this chapter has got verses in it that people often treat as inspirational nuggets. Rejoice in the Lord. In everything, pray. The God of peace will be with you. And those words find their way onto posters or maybe a home screen superimposed onto a beautiful sunset. But those verses, if you like, read by themselves in isolation as, if you like, a good thought to get us through the day, well, that's to read them like Bill. That is, you've already made your plan, you've got your ambitions in life, and those best thoughts, well, they might give you a little nudge, a little help, but not much more. But that is not why the Apostle Paul wrote this chapter. 
Now, Ralph, as many of us will know, is a marathon runner. Will little Ansgar grow up to be a marathon runner like his father, or will he have more sense than that? Well, last week we saw in Philippians chapter 3, in fact, every Christian believer is a runner. In all of life, we are straining forward to what lies ahead. We are pressing on towards the goal. And Philippians has shown us this really is a challenging race because we are to live as citizens of heaven because that's where we are, that's what we, who we are, that's where we belong. But the challenge comes here on earth by being surrounded by those who are, what well, we saw last time, enemies of Christ and the cross. But that is an opportunity as well, because we can now give ourselves for the advance of the gospel, to work really hard for the progress and joy of others in the faith. All of this is to run the Christian race. Uh, So let me say, maybe you're here this afternoon with us as a non-runner. That is, you're not a Christian. Well, you're very, very welcome to listen in to what Paul has to say. Some here Well, you might say you are a Christian, but in all honesty, you're still behind the barriers watching others run. Well, again, this is for you, but again, you won't quite hear it in the same way. Because Paul is writing these words for the runners, those who are out on the course. Now, if that's us, we may not feel we are running terribly well, but we haven't yet dropped out. And Paul wants to help us, to strengthen us, to keep on running. And he does that in three ways. First of all, keep running side by side with others. Now, most runners treat the London Marathon as an individual event. But two friends named Damien Thacker and Luke Simmons did it three-legged. I don't know if this is a British thing, but um, on sports day, you might remember when one person ties their left leg to somebody else's right leg, and they try and move as fast as they can with comedy results. Well, Damien and Luke did that for 26 miles, and in an astonishing three hours and seven minutes, they finished. Now, too many believers, Christian runners, run the race as if it's an individual event a solitary activity. Now, we don't tie our legs together, but we must run side by side with others. Look at verse 2, where Paul says, I entreat Iodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Think about this. This is amazing that Paul would do this. This is a public letter to be read in the church, maybe a bit like this. And look what he does. He names Iodia and Syntyche. So obviously we think this situation must be serious, and it is, but maybe not quite in the way we might assume. There's no indication of any significant doctrinal disagreement or problem. Presumably if there was, Paul would address it, nor any mention of what we might call a serious moral failing. So what's the problem? Well, look again in verse 2 what Paul is seeking. For these ladies to agree in the Lord. So it looks like these women must have had some sort of falling out, an argument maybe, and need to sort it out. Maybe there's a stony silence between them and maybe more than that, but we're not told any of that because actually the particular dynamic of this woman's relationship now is not the focus of Paul's concern. In fact, it's not impossible that had you turned up in the church in Philippi, you thought Iodia and Syntyche got on just fine. So what's the problem? Well, the point is what these two ladies are not doing, or rather no longer doing. Let's think about this. He entreats them to agree in the Lord, or we could say they need to think the same thing. Or even, we might say, they need to have the same mind. And putting it in that language maybe reminds us of what we've seen in Philippians, this major theme of our mindset, which, yes, starts with our understanding of Jesus and the gospel, but much more than that, a mindset is then the difference that makes in all of life, in practice. So I take it, Yodi and Syntyche, they were clear on their understanding of the gospel. 
So what's the problem? Well, look at verse 3. What did they used to do? They used to labor side by side with the obvious implication that's what they are no longer doing. And again, that language of side by side might remind us of what Paul wrote earlier in the letter. He told us back in chapter 1 that if we have the same mindset, believing the same gospel, that should lead to, chapter 1, striving side by side in the faith of the gospel. So how is your Christian race going? Well, I think to myself, I still believe the gospel. Here I am in church on a Sunday. Although no doubt Euodia and Syntyche could have said the same. Imagine maybe the Apostle Paul asking you, how is it going with others at the 4 p.m.? And let's say our response, my response would be, well, oh yeah, yeah, we're getting on really well. I love spending time together on a Sunday afternoon. But you notice Paul sort of furrowing an eyebrow and looking at you. You get a bit uncomfortable. And Paul says, well, by asking you how it's going, I meant how's it going actively striving side by side with others at the 4 p.m. for the sake of the gospel? It's quite a challenge. What would that look like for us? Well, that's for us to discuss afterwards. How do we put that into practice? But one example for which I'm giving thanks, the guest event we had here on Tuesday, which we hosted. It was wonderful to have guests with us thinking about the Lord Jesus, but also to see lots of you working side by side after a no doubt busy day in the office or wherever else, coming in and giving yourself for the sake of others hearing the gospel. That is what Paul wanted Euodia and Syntyche to be doing, that sort of thing, and us too. And it'll apply in all of life. How about your workplace or school? Maybe there are other Christians there. Maybe, again, you get on fine. There are no particular issues between you, you think. But Paul would say, but are you agreeing in the Lord? That is, that together you have the same gospel, so what are you doing with it to strive side by side for the sake of others? Well, it's a challenge already. We're only two verses in. But Paul doesn't only exhort us here. All the way through this passage, we'll see he'll also give us the reasons and the motivations to keep running. Paul knows running this race is hard. Maybe even as we've heard what he has said to us already, we're thinking, oh, but we'll miss out on other things. We feel that temptation in the race, maybe to quit or maybe just to ease up just a little bit. So Paul's reminder for us here at the end of verse 3 is that those who strive side by side for the faith of the gospel are those whose names are in the book of life. I wonder, where do you want to see your name? Where would you like it to be? Where would Ansgar in the future have his name? MC told us earlier a little bit about what they were hoping for. Him. But for us, do we want our name maybe on that certificate? on that acceptance letter, on that platinum card in our wallet, up in lights somewhere, maybe on the partner's board, on the title deeds to that property. Paul says, remember, the book of life. And that's what matters. Whether or not our name is in the book of life will determine our eternity. You can't work your way into this book. You can't buy your way in at all. Simply a gift of infinite value to anyone who simply trusts in Christ. But if our name is there, well, it's done. We have a relationship with Christ now, and we have this glorious future of life guaranteed, better by far than anything else which will help us as we keep running side by side with others, working hard for the faith of the gospel, it may well cost us. We may have to dig very deep, but only till the finish line, which is there, and there we'll find our name in the book of life. So keep running side by side with others. Next, Paul tells us, keep running with joy and thanksgiving. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. 
Again, I will say, rejoice. I hope you remember this is not the first time we've been exhorted like this. Beginning of chapter 3, Paul said, rejoice in the Lord. We obviously need to hear this, but maybe at this point, again, we're just rolling our eyeballs a little bit. Maybe we're tempted to respond, well, that's all very well for Paul in his apostolic ivory tower. But then we remember, he's not in an ivory tower. In fact, the Philippians would remember when they first met Paul, when he came all the way to Philippi to give them, to share with them the gospel. How did the town, if you like, treat him for his efforts? They beat him, threw him into prison, put him in the stocks. So what would Paul do? Lick his wounds with self-pity? But in Acts 16, we're told, Paul and Silas at midnight were singing hymns to God. And now in Philippi, he's writing this letter from yet another prison. Do you remember chapter one? He was still rejoicing. Even there in prison, even, do you remember, as other Christians were intentionally stirring up trouble for him. Still, he said, I will rejoice. And that's what he wants for all believers like us, to rejoice. And look, verse four, to rejoice always. Now, as we are running along, Maybe we are thinking, how can that be possible? For a start, though, if we are to rejoice always, Paul must mean that can't actually depend on the kind of day we are having. Because there will be better days, but there will also be worse days. There will be carefree days, but the stressful days will come too. Yes, easier days, but also difficult days. So how can we rejoice in each and every day? Well, look again what Paul says. He tells us, rejoice in the Lord always. We need to develop the habit as we run of ensuring our rejoicing is not tied up with our daily or earthly circumstances, but rather that we are focusing on our Lord who is in heaven because he and what he gives us never changes and is never in doubt. We have the gift of righteousness. We have that future free from all that spoils life now, guaranteed. So rejoice. And there's more motivation that Paul then makes explicit to keep on running. Comes at the end of verse five. The Lord is near. So we're looking to heaven where Jesus is. We are citizens of that place. And we also know he is near. He's soon to return to earth. And we've just heard at the end of chapter 3, when he comes, he will transform this lowly body to be like his glorious body. And so, Paul goes on, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Again, it's another moment that is easier said than done. Briefly, before we go on, worth saying, Paul here is not addressing every kind of anxiety especially as the word anxiety is used today. He's not trying to say all there is to be said about it. Rather, his focus, if you like, he is seeking to address the kind of anxiety that is caused by the concern that if I run the Christian race as I should, all out, then what will that mean for me and my life? What might I lose? Will I really make it through? All believers are at least tempted to think like this, even to worry about it. And it's this sort of anxiety that makes us, well, slow down, maybe even stop. So what's to be done? Verse six continues. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The Lord is near And we already have any time access to him. It's a stunning privilege. In every situation that causes us worry, we can pray. And yet, as we know, we tell ourselves we're too busy to pray. Too busy on our own to pray. Too busy to meet with others to pray. To which Paul, of course, would simply say, that's right. You're too busy. Find the time, make the time, and ask God for what you need. Articulate your requests, bring them before him. He wants to hear it. But not only make your requests, 
Don't turn it into just listing things like some glorified wish list. Look at the heart of verse 6. Paul put there, with thanksgiving. Don't we need that reminder? Especially when there are things we might be anxious about because those problems grow and they loom so large. The concerns begin to engulf us and we become blinded because there are always good gifts of our Father for which we can give thanks. All the gospel blessings and privileges, which Paul has spoken about in this letter, be thankful. And then more than that, in all of our lives, day by day, there will be much which we can give thanks to God. So Paul is saying, make it a discipline. Recognize those things. Bring them to mind. And so be overflowing with thanksgiving as we make our requests to God. Paul here, of course, is painting a portrait of a Christian. How can you spot the Christian? So yes, they will be running, working hard, sweating, feeling the heat, and yet at the same time, joyful and thankful. The Apostle Paul, even in that prison cell, was rejoicing and giving thanks. It's what he's known for. And he wants the same to be true for us. Are we known for being grateful, full of joy? Well, if not, let's pray. Let's ask for God's help to be more like that. Well, and if we do this, if what we've seen in verse 4, rejoicing and praying with thanks, it will make a difference. There's no promise here that life will become easy. Now, obviously not. But, even better, verse 7, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, to live as a citizen of heaven while still here on earth, well, it certainly won't make sense. Certainly not to citizens of earth. Those around us will look at us and the choices we are making, the way we're spending our time, they will think we are making foolish decisions. We are missing out on what's worth having. And yet, it may well be that we are at peace. And that'll be very hard for those around us to understand. They won't get it. Even to some degree, maybe we won't get it. We can see all these reasons we should be really stressed, but we are at peace. And why is that? Because as promised, the God of peace is protecting us and guarding us. So keep running side by side with others, with joy and thanksgiving. And third, keep running in all of life. The sprinter Usain Bolt was once asked for the secret of running fast. He said, if you're not mentally prepared for the challenge ahead, you will fail. Look at verse 8. Paul says, finally, brother, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I wonder what we make of that verse. I assume we've got no objection to such things, yet I wonder, do we find it, well, just a little bit trite, maybe even underwhelming, pedestrian, even mundane? So yeah, okay, these are nice thoughts, of course, but, well, maybe Paul's running a bit short of material. He needs to pad it out and put it in at this point, and no one's going to object to it. Or maybe having read Philippians to this point, you realize this verse is in fact key, fits with a major theme of our letter, which is what is in our minds. Still maybe at this point in Philippians, we can slip into thinking that what's in our heads doesn't really matter all that much. It doesn't really affect the rest of life, how we're doing as a Christian, how we are running the race. How quickly we forget that Jesus asked us to love him with all of our minds. And biblically speaking, it's very obvious. What fills our mind will inevitably shape our lives. Do we take that seriously? That if we fill our mind with what is honorable and pure and lovely and commendable, then we will, over time, with God's help, become ourselves all the more honorable and pure and lovely and commendable. 
if you fill your mind with rubbish, or even, if you like, with all this stuff that doesn't really matter, and again, that cannot but impact the kind of person you will be. So the question is, what will fill our minds? And Paul is saying, you must choose. You are responsible. You must decide for what goes into your head. Because so often we're passive, aren't we? We call it downtime, but we just give open season for anyone or anything to fill our heads. Maybe we just take TikTok or YouTube or Netflix and whatever they suggest, we go, yeah, fine, and just look at that. Doom scrolling really is bad for us because too often we just don't think. We don't even think about what to think about. But look at end of verse 7. Paul says, choose to think about these things, about what we must do. So, of course, Paul is saying, do everything we can to get rid of the filth. We must obviously do that. But it's not as if that is enough, as if you can somehow leave your brain empty, a vacuum. There's no doubt that, again, if we're not proactive, what will flood in? We've actually got to choose what we are going to put in our minds. But what? Well, let's read on. Verse 9, Paul says, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So those Philippians, they've heard Paul speak. Now they are reading his letter. And Paul is saying, fill your minds with these things that you've heard. Because, of course, Paul, as the apostle, was speaking the words of God. The God who himself is honorable and pure and lovely and commendable and excellent and worthy of our praise. So if we want our minds to be full of such qualities, well, immerse ourselves in the words of the one who is like that. And of course, we have much more than only Philippians. We've got the whole of the scriptures. So this is a challenge that do we soak ourselves in them? Do we take hold of the Bible and read it so much so, not to just tick a box that I've done it today, but that I want this to shape my thinking? Verse 8, if you like, is not just going to happen. We've got these hobbies and interests, which may not be bad things in and of themselves, but they so engross our time, and we leave the Scriptures to one side. So to obey verses 8 and 9, I'd guess most of us, if we aren't there already, are going to have to stop doing something else. You can't squeeze it in around the edges. This is so important, so much better. We will choose to do this. There will need to be discipline to carve out time, to read, mark, learn, inwardly digest, to memorize, to meditate on the scriptures. And then over time, our minds will be shaped by these scriptures. We will start to think in ways that are honorable and just and pure, lovely, commendable and excellent. And of course, Paul's aim is not just in the head as we've seen. He is aiming for more. So that's why in verse 9, he also points the Philippians to what they have seen in him. And we've seen it too, the astonishing example of Paul in this letter. As his mind was renewed and changed in these ways, even then in worldly terms, he faced the greatest stresses and pressures. Still, he was different. He was like God and lived for him. We can learn from an example like Paul. And this pattern of example is something Paul is hoping we will do from others as well. So Paul is encouraging the Philippians and us to seek out those who, well, in them you see this way of life, which must show they are thinking in a different way. So find the people who, as it seems to us, are running really well. They are putting into practice all the things we've seen in Philippians. I think often we are actually a little resistant to do this because the way that Christian lives with clear gospel thinking and priorities, well, it's actually a little uncomfortable. <laughs> but Paul is saying that's exactly the kind of person you need running beside you, maybe even a little bit ahead of you, and you're trying your very best to keep running with them. Find them, imitate them, 
in all of life. And then Paul gives us a final reason and motivation to run, because the God of peace will be with you. It's there at the end of verse 9. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul knows the Christian life does not always feel peaceful. There are battles to be fought, and yet we are to realize in Christ we are safe, completely. The God of peace is with us every pace of the way. So run that race. Keep on running the race. Run side by side with others. Run with joy and thanksgiving. And run in all of life. I'll lead us in a prayer. Our Father, we do so praise you for all that you have done in Christ to write our names in the book of life. And so now, would we keep running, striving forward in these ways until that day when the Lord Jesus returns? Thank you that you are always with us. Amen.